Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to today's partner web conference. This is Fast Track Dynamics 365 for Finance and Operations Tech Talk. Today's topic, Performance Benchmark for Dynamics 365. My name is Janice and I'm going to be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live Events and the audio can be heard through your PC speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. If you do not consent to be a part of a recorded session, we ask that you please disconnect now. Attendees may access the web conference recording within 72 hours via the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, you can turn on the Q&A panel by selecting the question mark icon located in the upper right hand corner of your screen. We do have presenters standing by to answer your questions throughout the session. Now moving on to the presentation presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have senior R&D solution architect Christopher Lim. And joining Christopher is also a senior R&D solution architect Jeff Liu. So without any further delay, Christopher, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Janice. All right, uh, welcome everyone for this tech talk on performance benchmark. So within Fast Track, we've made already several tech talks around performance because this is really a critical topic for any implementation of Dynamics 365 for finance and operations. We did one to help you defining your testing approach uh, for performance. We did another regarding the troubleshooting tools that are available in the standard solution. We did another on the key patterns and edit patterns. And now we're closing the series with um, this one on performance benchmark. It was one of the top demand actually. So today, what we are going to cover specifically is how you would define uh, your approach for the performance benchmark. There is preparation to think about and uh, most of the time, the critical scenarios will not be targeted. So the performance benchmark will not be optimal. We're going to share with you some real life experience. And actually we're going to cover in more detail a demonstration of the Perf SDK. Jeff is going to do a demonstration to show you how we can rapidly use it for this. Keep in mind that we're not going to cover any external use of uh, ISV solutions. We know that exists in the field. We're not going to cover the um, automated testing with the regression suite automation tool. We're going to share links and resources at the end of the tech talk for that. And similarly, it's not going to cover any retail or on-premise RBD uh, deployment aspects. So the agenda is rather simple. We're going to take 15 minutes to review what's a performance benchmark. What would be a good approach, an efficient approach for preparing and delivering a performance benchmark and some recommendations so that you avoid some pitfalls and you follow good practices. Then Jeff will take the rest of the hour to uh, demonstrate uh, the Perfect DK with a real situation. So the performance benchmark, it's quite clear for most of our customers and partners. It's the simulation of the workload, interactive workload, so concurrent users, um, to verify what is the performance for a specific workload. Yes. In reality, it's very important to focus on the objectives for the performance benchmark. What are the reasons why you would do a performance benchmark? And in the end, you're coming back to business questions. The solution that you have implemented, you want to be sure that it will be able to handle real life workload and not just, you know, a few records that you're creating in your test environment. It could be that you also want to simulate the thousand users that you will actually have in six months or so. In some cases and for multi-phase projects, you could also see that at the beginning, there is very limited data in your production environment. In three years, you expect a very high growth of the database and you want to make sure that it will perform as good as today. Another very common um, case where a performance benchmark is very valuable is when you're going to have multi, multiple countries for the rollout. 
and you will start with a small one. So it will have limited number of users, limited number of transactions. And now you want to be sure that the solution is optimized for larger countries where you may have 10 times more users, 10 times more transactions. In the end, we're coming back to this a critical point is that the Prunes benchmark, it will give you evidence that whatever you have built with specific customizations, specific ISV solutions and a specific configuration, it can achieve the business objectives of the business. Uh, sorry, the performance objectives of the business. So you will confirm that all those critical processes for your company with targeted transactions and users volume, they will be able to perform within an acceptable duration and response time. So the outcome and the result, it's usually um, three main things. It's going to be a performance benchmark report where you will see the different scenarios, like so, different sales orders flow, for example, or a stock verification, a price verification. And you will see through the different iterations how they perform for a number of users. In this case, for example, we had 100 users simulated and we could see that initially, after the first iteration, it took nine minutes to perform the sys order flow at the same time as the other sys order flows. With the benchmark, we could identify bottlenecks, performance issues, troubleshoot them, fine tune the solution, and come back in iteration two and three to better results. So that at the end, all the critical scenarios for the business were achieving the objectives, less than three minutes. So at the end, you will get um, a report showing that you have achieved the objectives and you have the list of issues that was covered and the optimizations performed. And that's really the essence of the performance benchmark to have this set of evidence. Depending on your need, you may do the performance benchmark quite early in the project, during the project, or even after go live. For example, if you want to really validate the standard solution and its capabilities, you could do it during the analysis phase. If you want to actually test the SV solution, you could do it during design and development phase because you have already the solution from the ASV. You could do it as part of performance testing to confirm that the final solution, which is the standard blocks from Microsoft, the ASVs potentially, the customizations and the configuration, they are achieving your business objectives, or you could do it after go live, like the case I was mentioning, when you have multiple phases or you have multiple countries to roll out. For the methodology, it's very important to really think about how to approach the benchmark. We see sometimes in the projects we work with that the project manager will just ask a technical lead to do a performance benchmark and he will directly start on scenarios that he thinks are relevant and he will start fine tuning with no uh, specific target leading to in the end uh, no result whatsoever. So having an approach that is focused on what the business considers critical is very, very important. You're going to focus on their objectives, what is important for them in terms of processes, what would be the objective in terms of performance, so the duration of the process, the maximum response time of the interaction, you would least prioritize the scenarios to then prepare them. If you have the right scenarios, you can then work on the right preparation aspects, meaning creating the test scripts. If you need specific data in the system first, it means 
data expansion script. If you have a set of scenarios that are going to require um, horsepower, it would mean a spe specific environment, possibly a tier four, a tier five. And as you have done the preparation, you have the right scenarios, you have the right uh, test scripts, the environment is prepared, you can then execute the tests, analyze the results, and iteratively tune the system, tune the solution, until you have achieved the performance objectives. If you don't have those targets set, then you never know when to stop. So once you have achieved all the objectives, you have actually confirmed that the solution will be able to perform the workload requested by the business, and you will work on the report. So when you're doing a performance benchmark, you're actually focusing a lot more on, on interactive workload. So concurrent users doing a specific process or multiple processes at the same time. But to make it even more real life, what you could do is add other types of workload, like a batch job that would post or do incremental MRP workloads. You could also add integration that would happen post go live and during uh, the working hours. Simulation of uh, reporting and analytics workload. This would give you really a day in a life uh, testing scenario, testing situation. We want to make it real because in the end, after go live, it's exactly what's going to happen. The different users will have different contexts. So there will be a transaction mix happening at the same time on production, a different load pattern, and even at the device level, at the client level, there will be um, specific characteristics like in the network. So this concurrent workload, you want to ensure that it will not break your environment or whatever you have built. For example, as you're going to troubleshoot, if you detect any empty pattern, uh, you could directly work on that. What we recommend now to our customers is to watch this tech talk that Davy presented on the key patterns and key anti patterns so that you can already see if you're following the good practices or if some of your designs are following the wrong practices. One um, common problem that we see with partners who want to do a benchmark and who wants to start using the Perf SDK is that they don't really know how to prepare it. So we're going to share with you as part of this tech talk, a simple template to quick start so that you can uh, quickly capture the different scenarios and also the starting data point. So for example, here, We'll have for each line the different scenarios and the important data to capture their priority if they are peak hour meaning happening during the working hours the type of workload if it's been customized number of concurrent users and other things like the target duration um, target response time things like that and for the starting data point it's going to be a set of entities that would be needed as a baseline in your system, meaning that you need to write data expansion scripts to get that. So it will be a simple template that you can use and reach for your own benchmarks. And the link will be put um, in the Tech Talk page on Infopedia. The final critical aspect for the Pumpspin Park is really that it's an iterative process. Most of the time, the project managers will allocate just one iteration to do a sort of validation of the performance, but it's just not enough. You're going to have multiple loops, multiple iterations to basically identify the bottlenecks, if actually the scenario is running or not, 
if there is a few or many calls, if there is a um, uh, very obvious issue to fix, you will then work on the prioritized issues to develop a fix or request it to Microsoft if it's a standard bug or to the ISVs. You will get those fixes and you will test again. In the report, you will then see if now you can achieve the objective or not. And if not, of course, you will start again until you have met the performance objectives. So when you're planning the performance benchmark, always keep in mind that you will have multiple iterations unless you're 100% sure that all you have in the solution is perfect. Finally, on the activities, so we have listed them, it will be very important to set the proper responsibility. Uh, the most important point being that all the scenarios should be provided by the customer, by the business. What is important for them so that you focus on the right scenarios and that you prepare the right tests in the end. A few recommendations as you're doing your performance benchmark. I said it already, but do define the approach thoroughly. Understand the usage patterns before you start doing the testing. Understand the goals of this performance benchmark so that you do it at the right time with the right scenarios on the right environment. And know also the tools and the licensing requirements that are needed. So for example, the visual studio licenses, and even if you want, for example, a specific environment, a tier four, tier five, that would be an add-on. And you need to prepare that. And continuing on the environment, you need to make sure that you're going to select the right tier that will have sufficient power to cover the transactions mix and the number of users, simulated users. Also, as you have your scenarios, define really what would be the minimum data needed in the system, whether it's configuration, master transactions, historical, to plan time for that. You may need consultants to help you. You may need people from business or some data migration to happen first. So to make sure to consider that data preparation. And as you're preparing the test scripts, make sure that they work uh, in a single user mode first, multiple times to confirm that your tests are fully ready. Never assume that performance is only Microsoft's responsibility because when you're doing an implementation, you're indeed using the Microsoft standard solution, the infrastructure with the environments, the standard solution. But in the end, you're adding a ton of building blocks on top of that customizations, ISVs, configurations, even the type of devices being used could lead to issues. So do make sure uh, that whenever you have performance issue, you consider where it could come from, the different sources. So Microsoft or the ISV or um, the building blocks created by the implementation team. In the cloud world, keep in mind that Microsoft is going to do the sizing for the production environment. So if you were considering uh, a performance benchmark to do the sizing, it's not necessary. Uh, another misconception is that in the cloud, we have unlimited resources. It is not true. A bad design will not provide good performance. If you're working if you expect that the process can run in multiple thread and in the design it's monothreaded, uh, there's not much that can be done in the cloud. The final point is the most important. You cannot use the production environment to do performance benchmark or any performance testing. It will need to be done on a tier two, three, four, five, but on a non-production environment. In production, what you will be able to do is a final validation of your processes, 
following the go live preparation. And that's it. So now Jeff is going to show you the perf SDK in real life. And Jeff, I leave you the screen. Thank you, Christopher. Let me share my screen. I think you should be able to see my screen now. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, the Perform SDK, but I, there are some of things I can not able to demo it. First of all, is that I'm not able to demo like how you're going to pick up your scenario, how you're going to define your scenario, how you're going to define your performance goal because it's totally up to your customer's um, business case. And you also need to talk with your customer and understand, hey, when you want run the performance testing, how many of the um, history data, how many of the pick transaction volume you need to test against it. And also where you can get those configuration data, who is going to load the master data for the testing, those stuff. So you need to work with your customer, working the project team and finalize. And this is the step by step, if majorly is the assume you already have those uh, scenario, goal, transaction, configuration, history data, those those activity already done and then you are ready to capture the scenario and convert the scenario to a test screen and eventually convert the test screen to a multiple user testing, run the testing, touring it, add models, touring it, and then uh, eventually reach out your acceptable performance goal and conclude and report it. So the first one will be that define and capture your scenario. Normally you need to work with your business user and capture those scenario with the task recorder step by step. And then you will move to the environment preparation. The environment involved in here will be the developing environment as well as your performance testing environment. So the performance testing environment could be a tier two, could be a tier three or tier four, or tier five. It depends on the concurrent user you want to test uh, uh, and the uh, pick transaction volume you need to um, handle it during the test. Now eventually you will convert that uh, test record you capture for the scenario in the uh, step one as the uh, uh, C sharp uh, performance script. And then you will validate with the single user to make sure the script itself is working as expected. And it, do, uh, it does do what you expect the script, um, you know, to perform in the system. Then you will first have to convert that uh, single user test screen to the multiple user to be, uh, be ready for the load test. Then eventually when you run the test, then let's say you have, want to run the thousands of the use concurrent users to a particular of the scenario or multiple of the scenario. You most likely you are going to do a single of the execution, always just go to your target of the volume. You probably want to start at uh, 100 concurrent users first and then move to the 500 and then first move to 800 then probably move to the that's uh, uh, 1500 users just like this so basically you just add workloads incrementally and eventually you're going to run a multiple iteration together um, uh, work together with the Turing process in each of the iteration and eventually you can reach the goal and then you can pull out those the uh, uh, data and make the uh, summary report and show it to your uh, customer management team or whoever care about those uh, up, um, the benchmarking output and give the confidence to the team. Hey, this is the, what you can achieve with your current testing and give the team the confidence you are ready for the go live or you are ready to roll out some of the big uh, company or you know, a country or whatever of the, uh, you know, your test for. So let's now jump to the demonstration. So the first step, as we mentioned that you need to identify the scenario, you need to capture the scenario. To capture the scenario, basically you are going to use the uh, test record. So to do the test record, basically you go to the FNO uh, environment, you can do it in your uh, dev environment, you can do it in your uh, the performance testing environment, but just make sure you have the same data in there so you can reuse those uh, 
uh, uh, loss, uh, loss process and yeah, source configuration. Also, you need to make sure you have the same copy of the uh, code base in the environment. And basically, you just go to the gear and then click on the task recorder. It will show up the task recorder screen and then basically you go to the create recorder. You say, OK, this is my scenario. Let's say perfect talk. And then you hit start. Once you hit the start, you basically go to your base on the scenario. You just go to the screen, work through your step, step by step, and enter your uh, testing data in there. Once you're done, then basically you just come in here to say hey, and stop. Once you stop it, you will have the option to say, OK, I'm going to download this test record or the developer recording. So once you download it, basically you will get the XML file. For example, in my case, I will write records to other scenario and download the developer records for the um, uh, to be ready. Uh, you know, uh, for the uh, next step, then. Once you're done in here, then you will go to your development box. You will first going to convert the test recorder or developer recording as the single user of the test. So what you're going to do is that basically you come in the, um, uh, we should still make sure you run as the administrator. So um, if you purely just want to run the single user testing, you can do it without the administration uh, administrator permission. But if you want to run the you know, uh, load testing with multiple user, then eventually you will need to have the administrator permission to the dev environment itself. So from a single user perspective, single user testing perspective, you can do it in the in the Microsoft mentioned um, tier one environment. But for the load testing. You need to bring in that cloud host environment in order to get the uh, administrator access. Okay, to convert the developer uh, recording, basically you just go to the Dynamics Five Add-ins and then click on that Create C Sharp Perf Test from Record Recording. So the recording path is the where the XML file, where is your developer recording file saved in, then the Project path is that so you can use the our um, sample uh, performance SDK sample solution come together with the performance SDK by default is installed in your um, cloud host environment uh, or in your Microsoft uh, uh, mentions tier one box or downloadable with D. The only thing you need to be aware is that with a different type of environment, probably the location of the performance SDK is different. Well, the last parameter you enter in here is the perform SDK folder. So basically, you just pull in the perform SDK folder. For example, in my case, I use the cloud host environment. So the perform SDK will be in the K drive, and the folder I need to put in there is the perform SDK, perform SDK local director. Okay. So once you enter all this uh, value in there, you basically just uh, Come in here and say, hey, import. Once import is done, it will create a general folder, uh, generate a folder under your perform SDK sample solution, and it will create this, um, the C sharp class based on your developer task, uh, uh, developer record. So, with that, if you just want to run a single user testing, basically you can go to the uh, uh, test and, and then uh, um, you know, enable that uh, task explorer. And then it will detect the uh, test measure available in your current solution. And then you can simply come in here to click on, hey, I want to run the uh, 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 select test. And eventually you will see it will bring up the um, uh, um, IE screen or clone. It depends on uh, how you're going to set it in your cl um, cloud environment configuration. And you will see there's a pop up screen and eventually the uh, the, which, uh, the uh, single user task is going to work through the step you record in the developer recording and replace in your uh, in your uh, current environment. So let's uh, give it a few seconds. 
to start a discussion. Okay, as you can see, it was open a new browser and then it will link to your environment and it will kick out the uh, uh, um, the test, and, uh, test step based on your developer record. Okay, so eventually it will complete the execution. As you can see previously that it will show that this is complete and then you even uh, you can also see how, how long it takes to complete that particular scenario. Well, from a pure single user perspective, you probably will say, okay, uh, they actually have a couple of different ways to achieve the same goal. You just uh, think about from a single user. For example, you probably just want to record the scenario and replace it with the task record in the environment directory. Or you probably want to use that developer recording and use the regression uh, uh, suite automation tool and rerun the test. Then one of the uh, you know, advanced if you use the performance SDK is that probably if you have the single of the same process, but you want to test a bunch of the different data compilation, and that will going to result, uh, you know, leading some of the different behavior based on your core base. Then in this case, because you can first, you know, um, uh, edit the script itself, and say, hey, reading the data and put pop in, uh, run the testing with a single of the uh, process with a different of the data. And after you complete, you can identify, hey, whether is there any change you made so far in your dev environment is going to break any of the scenario based on different of the data compilation. Okay, so we well, assume it will complete the the, the, uh, the single user testing. Then we're going to first. Uh, um, as you can see right now, it already completely will close the browser. It will show you in total, it will take that two minutes to complete this scenario. Okay, then once you're done in here, then in the minimum level, you can answer, hey, my developer recording is fine. My single user test is fine. Then the next step is be convert the, uh, uh, the single user to the multiple user uh, and prepare for the load test. And before we move that, I forgot to mention previously that Besides you convert a script, it also requires you to make some change in the dev environment. The first thing you need to change is that because from the single user testing perspective, we are using the browser to simulate the, uh, um, uh, the procedure. So if eventually um, behind the scene, it will require some of the scenarios, the uh, uh, web drivers or for, for the environment with the platform update 21 or above, you need to have the Selenium that's 3.13 version follows the uh, environment uh, with the um, uh, below the T platform update 20. Then you need to go to the Selenium the 2.42 version. And once you download those uh, um, uh, the zip file, then eventually you need to copy the DL file in there. In, uh, uh, in one of the exe file and save it to under the perform SDK common external synonyms folder in there. And also you need to add a reference of the uh, web uh, driver DL to your performance uh, SDK sample solution as the one of the reference. Then another change need to happen in the cloud host environment configuration file is that uh, if you go with the platform update 21st or above, um, by default we ship in that a configuration file and configure it with the AAD authentication. But right now that uh, feature is not yet a GA. So what you need to do is that basically you need to open that uh, uh, cloud environment configuration file and then uh, coming out the AAD um, uh, portion as well as the keyboard's uh, configuration portion. And also you need to make a change in the authentication path that to change the, the AAD authentication as the value you can see in here. So all this end to end of the and step by step instruction where I document we are under the internal review and very soon we're going to publish those step by step instruction in our doc website. Okay, so 
right now you complete the single use test. You want to convert the single user test to the multiple user uh, uh, as a load test. Then what you should do is that the first of all, you need to first configure the depth environment and make it ready for the load test. The first step that you need to have the one of the environment variable add uh, to your depth environment call is the test root, and you're going to point this environment variable to the perform SDK folder. OK, this is the first step. Then the second step in the platform update 21st, uh, 21 and above, we are using the ODBC um, 17 version. So what you should do is that you need to download that uh, um, uh, 30, sorry, 64 bits version of the ODBC uh, version 17, and then you need to download that file and save it to the Visual Studio Online folder as this LAN in here, okay? And then besides this step, you also, because as we mentioned right now, we are not ready for the AAD authentication. Then how can we authentication across the environment? Because eventually the request is going to send either from your development environment in case you use your local test controller or from the uh, Azure DevOps, right? So there's authentication need to be done across the environment. Then how that happen? We are going to rely on the certificates. So you, if you read uh, the, our, our existing of the Perform SDK documentation, you will find that that you need to use the make search command to create a, a, a certificate. And basically, the one key information you need to be aware of is that you need to make sure that uh, CN name in there is the one, uh, 127.0.0.1. That is the mandatory right now. After you generate the uh, certificates, make sure you install them in the uh, uh, look under the local machines personal uh, store. And one thing you need to be aware is that uh, for the environment with the platform update 21 and above, by default, there is another of the certificate already installed in there with the same issuer. So you need to install the, uh, the certificate you generate. And the next, uh, in the following step, we have also have the step that will request you to grab that uh, uh, sampling of the uh, from uh, of the general certificate. So make sure that you grab the same uh, the red certificate uh, sampling from the red certificate. Okay. Then once you complete the certificate generation, you also need to copy that uh, uh, certificate to the uh, perform SDK loop folder and make it present in here because later if we use the Azure DevOps, we need to upload the certificate to the uh, Azure DevOps. And the next one is that we need to make some change on the file present inside the Visual Studio uh, online folder. So basically there's two files you need to make change and the file you need to make change is the um, setup command. And you basically you're just going to point, use this the uh, replace the system content with the content you can see in here again because we're going to document uh, step by step, those information will present and in, in include in the documentation itself. And the second change that when you generate the certificate, you actually need a step. So, okay, you are not going to enter any of the password for your certificate. You are going to select LAN. So you need to remove this uh, uh, by default, there's the reference to the test certificate password in here. So basically you need to remove that reference and save the change in um, uh, save the change you made against the files. Then the next one is that you need to go back to the Visual Studio and make sure you need to test, uh, you need to uh, change that uh, testing architecture from the default value that's x86 uh, six to the x64. Uh, okay, then the next step you need to make the change is you need to go back to the cloud, uh, cloud environment configuration 
basically because for the load testing, you are not going to test again the dev logs any longer. You want to test again your performance testing environment. So you need to make sure that like host environment and so host uh, host them is point to your performance testing environment. Then how you can find those information? Basically, you just go to any of the uh, AWS environment in your uh, uh, performance testing environment and then go to the as the manager and go to the uh, AWS service and then you go to that abandoned. Then you will find that 80, uh, the port 80, then that's the host then. If you go to that uh, uh, 443, that the SOAP host then. So you need to copy and then paste it back to your dev environment. Then the next change you need to make in the um, cloud environment configuration is that eventually you need to determine, hey, how many of the testing user you're going to create for load, load testing purpose. Let's say if you want to uh, testing that the concurrent user for 3000, you probably want to create a 3000 of the testing user, or you probably just want to create 500 of the, um, you know, uh, uh, testing user and then we use those user to eventually get the loads to have the 3000 concurrent. Then besides the you, you need to change the user count to reflect the number of the testing user you're going to create. Then to create a testing user, there's two of the different way. The first, the first approach is that basically create a testing user under your talent. Okay, and the second approach, we also provide a command line called uh, create a user to allow you to create a user and import those user into your performance testing environment directory without creating under your talent. Then the different, the key difference is that if you create a by command, those user not going to present under your talent, you are not able to find, okay, what's the credential to, uh, you know, if you want to use those users to access the FNO environment. That's the one of the drawback. Well, if you use the uh, real testing uh, user under your talent, you don't have that issue. But the issue is that you're going to create a X number of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, user under your talent. Then whether that is a lot or, or it depends on the uh, real snail in your customer case. Then the next configuration is change to make sure because eventually the uh, load testing, the three are going to look into the testing user and identify, hey, how can I, which user is the test user? So you need to make sure the user format can reflect your test user, okay? And the rest of the test is the, uh, the, the rest of the change we already made during the single user test. So just skip it. Then the next one is that we're going to make the change to the, um, uh, we should do you know, online settings. So basically there's some of the change you need to make in here is that you going to say, hey, I'm going to run the testing with the local test controller or I'm going to run the uh, um, against with the Azure DevOps. Then the difference is that if you run the local test controller, then those the testing agent is going to host in your local dev environment. Then uh, because the dev environment probably, for, for example, in my case, I just provision is the D13 V2, then it's, there's a limited spec available. Basically, there's a limited resource available. Then you probably we will see that if you run the load testing, let's say uh, uh, with the 300 or 400 of the concurrent user, you will see the, um, the uh, testing agent will con going to consume that, for example, the CPU is going to reach out to the 99%. So you need to aware of Then if you go to the Azure DevOps, because it's a cloud service, it allows you to scale it and it can manage that uh, uh, snail. For example, you want to run the test against the thousands of the concurrent user. So the first step you need to choose, okay, you want which option you want to go. Then the second one is you're going to uh, enable the test and, and, and also you're going to, uh, you know, add some of the, uh, uh, folder as some of that surface or uh, cloud environment configuration file and another of the integration of the um, uh, file uh, configuration file as well as the Visual Studio online folder in here. Then you first you're going to uh, make the change is that uh, go to the hosting and you're going to say okay I'm going to run the testing with the 64-bit uh, process. 
Then there's another different data we will talk about when we uh, describe the difference between the loader and the uh, Azure um, DevOps. Then the difference is for the Azure DevOps, you need to first specify where is the setup script is. So basically you just point it back to your, uh, which is your online um, folder setup commands and it will upload the file under this folder and it will first install as an ODBC driver in there in order to issue the test, issue the test request. And after that, if let's say you have multiple of the uh, test screen, so you probably just doesn't like uh, in my case because I just for the demo purpose, I just have the single of the test screen in here. In here, you probably have the multiple types of script. Then eventually you need to come the uh, come here to add the text mix. You want to say, hey, how many of users going to run or how, uh, uh, what's the percentage of the uh, test is going to against a particular of the uh, test scenario. And you can further play with the test mix model that so you can refer back the which is still load test the documentation to understand what, how to use the different text mix model available from Visual Studio. Okay, and but the key step in here that you need to add all your testing scenario you want to run it uh, simultaneously in your test. Well, uh, the next one is that you probably first want to say, hey, when you run the test, you want to simulate with the like the LAN or 3G or Wi-Fi, so it's based on your needs. And also, you need to come to the uh, run setting to say, hey, how long I going to run the te uh, testing or how, uh, how long the warm up will be and how long the execution duration will be. So let's say you probably want to run, hey, I want to have these thousands of the user, I probably want to have the warm up that's uh, 45 minutes or one hour, or when you run the execution, you probably want to run it's one hour, two hour, it depends on your uh, scenario, okay? Then um, once you complete the uh, configuration, then in the dev box, then the next step is that you need to change the um, uh, testing script itself. So let me just uh, quickly open one of them to walk you through quickly about how to, uh, what kind of change you need to make for each of the test uh, C-sharp test uh, class you generate. The first one is that you need to add a user statement in here to show, okay, there's some of the UI helper because doesn't like the uh, a single user test, you are not going to see that uh, pop, uh, the browser is going to pop up. Basically, we inside of memory are going to simulate how the user is interacting with the browser, you know, at, um, uh, at the payload against the AOS. This is the first step. Then the second step that you need to you need to uh, make the change to the test setup. So you need to add low, uh, this statement in here. And also, there's some of the um, uh, coming out uh, um, by default uh, 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 statements that is used for multiple uh, user testing. So you need um, comment close the statement, and also you need to come out the default uh, instance assigned to the uh, uh, client because that's for the single user test. Then you need to first make a change in the testing cleanup measure in order to you know uh, uh, make a change like this. Then in the testing method itself, you probably want to make some first test. For example, by default, if you capture the scenario, you will enter the uh, test the value or test the data in there. It will capture it and it will default, you try to use those the, um, the value you enter when you capture the scenario to run the test. Well, in your real case, you probably want to say, for example, if this is a create a sales order, you probably want to say, I want to uh, have the uh, 100 of the um, uh, customer available in there. I just want to randomly select one of the customer. If you change the customer, you want to first to say, hey, based on the uh, customer I select, I probably want to randomly select a set of the item number. And you want to say, uh, firstly, you want to say, I want to randomly set up some of the uh, image location based on some of the rule. So you probably want to first make some change in your test screen um, to random your data. Then the second one is that you probably want to, you know, um, 
from the uh, what you try to simulate the user's behavior, right? So from the user behavior perspective, when he or she try to perform some of activity in the system, he probably will get some of the interruption. For example, when you create a sales server, just create a, uh, uh, you know, enter the customer uh, account in there, then somebody lock your door, then you want to talk to the person first before you go back, uh, come back. So that means that you try to simulate that scenario, then you probably want to say, I want to add some of the random posts in there. Then from our term perspective is that we call it, you probably want to add some sync time, uh, sync time in there. Then you probably want to first render in those sync time. In in this case, we don't. Uh, uh, in my demo, I I uh, I didn't uh, you know add those changes. I just uh, 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 you know use the default of the value. It's no sync time at all. And firstly, you even want to you know um, let's let me use another of the K sales order. Okay. Um, from, uh, from the performance test perspective, uh, uh, in the first a few of the iteration, you want to understand, hey, for load, load, load testing, which of the process probably is the potential of the bottleneck? Then you eventually will probably want to answer, hey, for for example, uh, in my uh, in this uh, case, basically I just create a sales order and confirm it. And most of the case, you probably say, I confirm the sales order probably is the snow uh process then how you can prove it basically you want to see hey how long that particular of the step uh take uh takes during the load test then what you can do is that you can add some of the timer score to capture how long uh, the the um that particular of the step uh takes during the load test so basically you add the beginning and end the timer in there and after you run the testing you can pull out a report and prove hey, whether this step is, is slow or actually there's another step. So you probably want to uh, do some touring against it. So with that, you complete the change of your uh, test screen. You can build your uh, build your solution. Then you're going to move to make some change in your um, perform test environment. Then the first step you need to uh, you need to make change is that you need to install the uh, case you generate it in the depth environment in the, uh, under the local machine personal uh, uh, store in there. Then the second step that you need to make it a change. Basically, you need to add the um, some print of the uh, certificate you generate in the depth environment to the uh, WF configure file. So you you need to add under this uh, authorities session. So this is the one I add for my demo purpose. OK, and after you add the um, make the change, you need to also uh, restart the uh, AS to make sure it can uh, AOS and other stuff can uptake the change. Then the next one will be that either you use the create user command to create the user in uh, in your uh, perform test environment, or if you go with the real test user, you just uh, uh, import those the test user, and you also probably want to assign these uh, administration, um, you know, system administrator role because you are not going to test against the uh, the, the uh, security itself. All right. So with that, then basically mean that once you complete the uh, sandbox environment, you complete the uh, configuration in the dev environment, you complete the change against your core. Uh, test and screen, then you are ready to run the test. So basically, you just um, um, come in here to open the load test and make sure you have the load test maze or other configuration uh, configured based on your needs. And then you come in here and then the, run the load test. Then in my case, uh, by default, I use in the Azure DevOps in my uh, in my current Dev environment. But if you use the uh, local test uh, controller, it's also uh, it will start to uh, prepare it and eventually it will start to the um, uh, run the load test. So once you start the load test, then immediately you want to start to monitor the testing itself. Then how you're going to monitoring, how you're going to troubleshooting, how you what kind of tool available. Then you can refer back our 
tech talk regarding that performance troubleshooting tools. OK, then basically what you want to do is that uh, you probably want to go to the um, uh, um, environment monitoring in your um, uh, performance test environment and use the environment monitoring in there to monitor a during your testing scenario how many of the uh, how the CPU usage uh, sorry how the DTU utilization looks like or you because in the uh, this is a sandbox if you want to capture the um, uh, let's say you want to capture some of the CPU or you want to capture some of the memory utilization then you can use the Windows tool that uh, called the performance counter and um, uh, or some of the other tool as long as you can use it or you are favorites then you can bring in and you can capture those the data in order to understand how the utilization looks like. Um, so uh, during after the testing completes, basically you want to answer some of the question. Hey, in overall, how my DTU utilization look at how my CPU utilization so from CPU DT, uh, from CPU or memory perspective, perform counter can provide you the data. While from DTU perspective, if you just uh, let uh, let's say if you just run one hour, then probably the environment monitoring. Right now we have we you can go back for the 60 minutes, right? Then it should be fine. But if you run that for a few hours, then probably you need to use some of the uh, uh, query store. For example, the screen in uh, like uh, look like in here to to pull all those the uh, uh, DTU uh, utilization during the uh, load testing, but Keep in mind is that from the uh, query store perspective, it just keep the data for uh, let's pass. I think uh, past uh, two or three hours. So you need to make sure during your testing, you probably you from time to time you need to come here to capture some up data for analyze the in and in, uh, in the later stage. And let's say you complete the testing and uh, and you want to identify whether is there any of some of the slow query then. You can go back to the query store, go back to the environment monitoring, use the um, the skills that you have uh, with the performance troubleshooting monitoring uh, and the tool available in there to look into some of the data. For example, whether is there any of the snow query, who is the um, you know top uh, resource consumption query, what's the execution plan looks like, uh, some of the information like this. Or if you want to, uh, in the first a few of the iteration, you probably want to first capture some of the trace in order to do some of the trace analyze. Okay, there's a lot of things you can do in there, and eventually the test itself will complete the execution. Um, this one is still under the uh, warm up stage, but I do have some of the uh, uh, complete test case. So for example, this one eventually once you complete, this is the report you will get from the load test from the uh, Visual Studio and you can first look into some of the um, uh, graph and you also report itself is go, uh, tell you how in total how many of the compliant user, uh, um, you know, load during your testing, uh, you know, how much test case been done in the uh, um, uh, uh, per second during the execution uh, stage and also you can get uh, a report for each each of the click for each of the entry value in there so so each of the step you uh, you will see in average uh, the response times look like and in total how many of the execution counts for that particular of the step and let back to those the DTU stuff, then you can even further come back to some of the graph, use the data kind of some of the graph like this. And you can also take advantage of some of the, let's say you run the load test multiple times. Then from the, we still there's a, there's a Excel report you can create. You can start multiple of the testing, uh, load testing, then you eventually it can generate a comparison report for you. And then you can see hey, uh, across the different of the load testing, whether it's there any regression, then you probably want to first uh, analyze why there's some of the regression happen on those area. Okay, and uh, similarly, uh, previously we said we add some of the timer score. So with the report you can uh, capture from the visual studio, you can see or oh, for particular of the incident uh, 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 process, what's the average of the response time 
So that we're going to help you to understand, hey, whether lost the, uh, lost the particle of the step, you need to spend more time to do the touring, to do the trace, to do the first analyze, and, and eventually uh, to you know, you know, add the incremental load for your next execution until you achieve your performance goal. So with that, uh, uh, the next and the last thing I, uh, I think I already covered. So, but I just let me uh, just re repeat it. So from the um, from the uh, load testing, as I mentioned, there's the more, uh, there's two uh, two way you can run the uh, load test with the local test or with the Azure DevOps. Then if you go to the Azure DevOps, there's another step you need to do is that you need to make sure that you connect your uh, Visual Studio um, to your Azure DevOps. Um, when you connect it, because right now if you uh, look into the Azure DevOps, it basically let's say is the account and other stuff, right? But when you connect to it, make sure uh, I don't have one of them opened. Uh, in this environment, you should have. Yeah. So when you connect to your Azure DevOps, make sure you use the old uh, format of the uh, 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 Azure DevOps UI or formatting. So basically, go to your um, uh, uh, Azure DevOps account dot visitors account. The reason that you need to go this way is because if you don't enter the uh, uh, connect your Azure DevOps in this way, then eventually when you run the load testing, it will tell you, hey, this uh, is expecting to have the Azure DevOps, but you don't connect it. And besides that, you also need to click once uh, that's to open the uh, open in with Studio from the uh, dashboard of your Azure DevOps. OK. Then after you open it, sometimes it will not open it as the administra uh, administrator mode. Then you need to close it and then reopen it. Yeah, basically uh, that's all the things I want to demo. So then there's some of the tips and tricks I want to share as well. So the first thing is that um, you definitely need to, when you capture your scenario, you need to go through the scenario first to make sure you understand What's the step where you uh, where you're going to open the page? Where which button you're going to click? Where you're going to enter the value? Do that first before you capture it. Then when you capture the screen, uh, capture the snail with the task record. Um, do not go with those uh, drop down. For example, if you want to uh, enter the uh, item number, do not select it from drop down. Instead, you capture the value and enter the manu value manually. The reason you need to do in this way because if you capture from drop down, it will capture the, those activity and if eventually it's going to convert those activity as the test part of the test screen. Then it makes it difficult for you to, you know, if you want to add some of the additional logic in there. Then from the single user uh, and load a multiple user perspective, it's good that if you can capture and uh, keep another copy of the single um, user test screen available. Then whenever you want to make any change, you probably want to quickly run through a single user and capture some of trace and see, hey, what's the difference between your um, from the performance factor between your previous run and the current run and see whether this is the, what uh, the trend you want to see. Then from the workload perspective, as we mentioned, that you always need to add workload incrementally instead of go to your final target immediately. Then from the testing user perspective, because you will go through those validation, you sometimes you probably you need to use some of the test user to log in F and O and run a scenario and see hey whether is there any of the issue or whether it's then pop up and they're going to prevent the test uh, test screen skill that during the load testing. Then in those cases, better you you can have some of real test user you can understand what's the account, what's the credential, and eventually you can use those account login to the FNO and run some of the manual uh, testing and validation with that particular account. Well, in your real testing, you, uh, in the uh, final te uh, load testing, you probably want to go to the um, uh, create user command, as so probably you don't want to uh, uh, create less thousands of the users under your AAD. Okay. So that's all I'm going to share in this session. Then Christopher, 
back to you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, can you hear me now? Or yep, should work? Yep, right? great. Yep. Perfect. So let's wrap up. On the approach, we have recapped uh, the key points in a checklist fashion so that you can ask yourself the right questions if you have sufficiently studied the existing material. So for example, the tech talks that Jeff was mentioning on the tools, on the testing approach, on the different performance patterns, on the methodology itself. So how you have defined the scenarios, the starting data point, the preparation with the environment and so on and so forth. So use that as a basis. And for the actual use of the Perf SDK, Jeff mentioned it already, but we know that the existing documentation on docs is a bit outdated. So this will be revamped to cover all those steps that are right now manual. Um, and it will happen in the coming weeks. Additionally, as I said, some sample material that we showed uh, at the beginning of the presentation will be attached to the Infopedia page. So you will be able to access that in a week or so. Uh, I just wanted to come back before we close the presentation on a question regarding the licensing requirements. So as we said, it's needed uh, to have a tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five environment or the performance benchmark. So that would be considered a, a license and it will be necessary to have a Visual Studio Enterprise license as well. And if you're going with uh, the DevOps load tests, there may be additional needs there. So this closes the presentation. Uh, we hope really that it helped you to demystify the performance benchmark and to understand a bit more how the Perf SDK could be used. And hopefully it, it was useful to you. So feel free to share your feedback and any other questions, points that you would like us to cover in additional tech talks. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Back to oh. you, Janice. All right, thank you, Christopher. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take a brief moment here and bring your attention to a link that I posted in the Q&A panel. That's a link to a short survey for this web conference, and we ask that you please take a moment before logging out to access it. We hope that you found today's information helpful, and if you enjoyed today's web conference, have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, or you'd like to submit topics for future web conferences, this is your chance to let us know. The survey scores are on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible. And that is going to conclude today's web conference. Attendees can access the web conference recording by the same registration link that was used to attend today's live broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter team, Christopher and Jeff, and thank you audience for logging in and joining us today.